Uh, there we go. So go ahead, uh, Courtney Stecker, um, on the podcast again uh, with uh, a side of John Gain, a large sure. side, a heaping a side. Large side. <laughs> yeah, a side um, piece. I love it. I love it. Uh, we'll get into the specifics in a little bit, um, but uh, Courtney's son Wheeler has Batten's disease, Batten's um, syndrome. Is what was the, what's the correct terminology? Batten disease. Yeah, Batten he disease. has juvenile Batten disease. Well, we talked last year um, about the whole thing, but we, as we like to start the podcast with a song, I think that's what we're going to do on a Wheeler's, I guess you, what you're saying, one of his favorite songs recently? Yeah, his his favorite song right now is Go To, and this will be a throwback for all of us, but uh, Tears for Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Uh -huh. Nice. Um, I was ho hoping for some Taylor Swift. <laughs> uh, um, hasn't, hasn't no, knock on, no knock on... on T Swift, uh, but yeah, Wheeler's she, more. She gets enough play. Classic guy. That's fine. I can see that in him. <laughs> uh, let's see what we got here. It's not going to come across very well in the um to us, but it will. A final production. You hear it over there at all? No. Anything? I can hear it. Jam out for us. Yeah. All right. We'll work on that technical uh, piece of the of the thing. It's it's not, it's weird. Like I'll put it. I'll plug it into the. Um, I have a, just a kind of like a portable uh, production thing, podcast thing. And you'll plug it in and try to like uh, into the actual machine, but it only plays in through my ears. But I don't know. I'll spare, spare the details. But the final I, thing, I hear it. Uh, I hear it on loop. Pretty much. Like <laughs> you already hear. It, you already hear it in your head. Yeah, I, I don't even. I don't need to even hear, hear it, it physically <laughs> to have it run into my head right now. You probably, if you heard it, you wouldn't even know it because that's that's your normal state. Yeah. Uh, but welcome to the podcast again, Courtney, and and welcome John. Uh, John, I uh, longtime friends. Um, so, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole, the topic of the day is, is Batten's disease, a very, very rare condition of, uh, you, you speak to it better than I do, but it's a genetic condition, correct, Courtney? It is a, yeah, it's a genetic neurodegenerative, neuro uh, disease. Um, there are a number, um, I think 13, uh, mutations of Batten disease, uh, Wheeler's is CLN3, which is juvenile. Uh, Batten disease, uh, so symptoms onset typically between four and eight years old. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then go from there. Um, and, you know, so we, I think we covered this in the last uh, podcast. So yeah. for anybody super, who super didn't rare. see the first one, go check it out. It's, uh, you know, yeah. we gave a lot of the background info there, but um, it is an ultra rare neurodegenerative disease there are less than 40 kids in the entire country uh with his disease and um due to to a number of, of things wheeler is the youngest ever diagnosed in the world he was diagnosed at just four weeks old i thought last um yeah yeah i thought what is 500 pop in my head for is that a significant or, from the uh, last yeah yeah so 500 um so there's a lot of there's a lot of different numbers out there <laughs> Sorry. um no, it's it's okay. There, there's five hundred um, across 5, the board. They, they, what's that? Across the board cases. Across the board cases, yeah. yeah. And then there's also a number of the global, um, you know, global accounts. One of one of the the issues is uh, diagnosis. So his disease it it mimics a number of other uh, disorders or disabilities. It can mimic similar uh, symptoms to autism, um, ADHD, um, PAD. There, there's just a number of different things. So typically because of the, the rarity of the disease, uh, typically it takes a while for families to get a diagnosis after symptoms onset um, because it is so rare. Juvenile bad disease is not the first thing, um, you know, when, when a child loses their vision, um, as you can imagine, you go to the pediatrician, go to the ophthalmologist, they're not seeing anything irregular. 
go through all these things and then finally, you know, a year or two years down the road, um, get a diagnosis for this ultra rare neurodegenerative disease. But it's not on the list of, you know, the top 20 things that doctors um, are testing for based off these symptoms. Right. Um, and so it, it mimics a number of other um a number of other disorders have similar um symptoms or or you know how how the disease presents itself within the kids. So it makes it very difficult to diagnose. It also makes it extremely difficult to treat. I should have I should have mentioned earlier, but I, I can mention it in the introduction. But um John, um John John not only Courtney's bodyguard, um and his agent, of course. Um, long story modeling career, yeah. um, but uh, one ways all over the world. That's right. He um, so for a long time, you guys have run a, a, a charity golf tournament, correct? The, the Gain Invitational. Yeah, I think we're on our third or fourth year this year. I yeah. uh, ran the Gain Invitational, started I'd say 10, 12 years ago, and you know that time of life we weren't faced with you know some of the hardships that we've seen, right? And I was explicitly, I was like, you know, inviting 25 guys out to play golf. And it was, this is not a charity, a uh, charity <laughs> thing. This is not for charity. You're out. This is a uh, Saturday afternoon and we're going to go play some golf. And if you have closest to the pin, you can grab a bottle of Johnny Walker and, you know, all proceeds go to those who participate, blah, blah, blah. And then <clears throat> fast forward, maybe eight, eight years ago, I uh, was hosting the event and I like to keep the, the budget tight and i found out that i like overcharged everybody by 10 bucks and i'm like oh what am i gonna do with this 400 bucks like, pocket <laughs> pocket so i sent an email what, to what like 400 <laughs> i sent an email to everybody i'm like uh i've got an extra 10 do you want me to venmo or like you know i can meet you at the course and give you and people are like john you're, you're being pathetic like why don't you give it to a charity i'm like okay i'll give it to a charity so we found a, a charity uh that was worthy of uh, the 400 bucks um and I, I felt good about myself and everyone felt good about themselves. And fast forward the next year, you know, known Courtney a long time since, uh, you know, actually Courtney was on our first date, my wife and I, and that's a long story, but uh, either way, Courtney's part of the family. And uh, it, it, this situation was evolving and we wanted to be supportive. And I said, how do you feel about me moving this uh, golf tournament uh, for good away from evil? And uh, Courtney was very supportive and, we've done you know a handful of good and we want to continue to do more and more in the future. So uh, as we support the Stecker family and then work towards uh, a cure for Batten's disease. That's a cool, that's a cool story. It's funny how some of the best things start just for the people messing around, you know, like I'm just playing golf or just like doing things that you love to do, but not necessarily with the intention of like raising money and trying to, to change things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's yeah. Just like, I, yeah. That's the way the world works, and in this yeah. case, it, it's, it's pure. Been working. It's pure for for good. Nice. In the last, I played last year was awesome. Uh, whoever's in charge of the weather, I hope you hire them oh, again. Yeah, unbelievable yeah. weather. I think yeah. I don't know if everyone would be praising the tournament quite as much if it were fifty degrees and rainy, but it was that <laughs> beautiful October day, and uh, hopefully that helps with uh, return customers and re- return donations and all that stuff. Amen. It was a great event, and so this is your. How many years have you been, have you been raising? and putting money toward battens this will be the third great three is a good number yeah last year we did around eighteen thousand dollars uh some of the money supports wheeler directly which you know brings a big smile to my face and then uh you know a decent portion supports research into the, the disease um which brings another smile to my face because it will support other families in the future uh, Amen. so it's a uh, it's a feel good situation, and um, it's brought you know, my network together. And Courtney's got a, a strong network as well, and we want to continue to bro, uh, grow yeah. the community of support. Sounds great. Um, back to uh, Courtney, if that's all right. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I you know no no no, no yeah. I'm just a side piece. We'll, we'll sprinkle it. In. <laughs> okay. Um. So uh, how's Wheeler? How's Wheeler? Wheeler's now is he five and a half? Because I yeah. Uh, so Wheeler's yep. Yeah. He's five and a half now. Yeah. And he, I mean, again, we talked a lot, some of the stuff might be found in the last pocket, but that was a year ago. We can talk about it again. I think um, you guys were, were a very unusual case. You and Judy in that, how uh, you knew that he had a, you knew he had battens after like the second or third day in the world. Correct. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
four weeks yeah so we we had him tested uh yeah 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 you yeah tested long like story, right at long yeah story short we knew we were carriers we had done ibf a number of times to to uh to try in all of our might to avoid you know the situation that you know this situation uh god has different plans uh Wheeler came. He was our miracle baby after years and years of of trying and different efforts and all that kind of stuff. And so we knew there was a chance, a twenty five percent chance of Wheeler being affected. Um, we decided to enjoy the pregnancy. Uh, we weren't going to terminate. Just mine and Judy's personal beliefs, and it, it wasn't an option for us. So we decided not to test in utero. Um, and but we had everything ready to go. So day after he was born while they were doing all the other blood work we we had the the batten test uh ready to go and was sent off and then at 28 days uh old is when we got the confirmation that that he was affected and, and got the diagnosis um for juvenile batten disease yeah yeah i mean even you said at 25 percent, but even if it was 100 percent, it sounds like um you would have still went to to, to bat so to speak or you know if, if it's a hard question to answer, right? If, if you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, these, these are, these are the questions that, you know, run through mine and Judy's head or at least mine, uh, you know, constantly the, the what if scenarios and, and this that, and the other, and, um, you know, it wouldn't have changed anything. I don't think so. Either. Um, you know, so without, you know, going down the the hour long description, I mean, we we went through a number of years, um, you know, five rounds of IVF, miscarriages, failed attempts, all of that. And, and we're pretty much told that it wasn't likely for, for Judy to get pregnant. Um, so we didn't even think it was possible. And so we took a step back and we were like, okay, let's all take a break. Judy had just started her job at HHS. That was crazy. You know, we were like, let's let's just take a break. And then uh, what I'm coming to find is not that uncommon of a story is that once you remove that stress and anxiety and pressure from your life, uh, once you think it's not possible and that kind of, at least in your head is off the table. Um, yeah. Then, you know, you get pregnant, uh, you remove all that, all, all those outside factors. Um, and so we, we really didn't think it was possible. And then, and then Judy uh, got pregnant. So we knew at that point there was a 25% chance. Um, yeah. And, and it wasn't going to change the outcome at that point. Um, and so, you know, even, you know, as you mentioned, hundred percent, I, I think, uh, you know, varying levels in terms of relationships and, and, you know, in terms of, my relationship or Judy or, you know, any of our relationships, you know, with God and our, our faith, but in my, at mine personally, you know, I mean, bad disease is awful. There's no way to, you know, there's no two ways about it. It is just an awful, awful disease. And, and the kids and the families that are impacted by this, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It's just a terrible thing. Um, you know, it's one thing to go through something yourself. It's another to have to watch your kid go through it and really feel helpless. Um, I mean, there's things you can do to minimize the impacts on a daily basis, try and make situations better, do all that. But at the end of the day, we're in a position in the world where, where there aren't any cures. At the end of the day, you're you're putting Band-Aids on on massive wounds you're not affecting change in the long term as a parent right um and and that's a really helpless place to be you know it it sucks um because as parents that's our job you know it's to raise our kids it's to discipline to love to train them up to go take on the world and be better than than you know we are um you know better than my goal is for both my kids to be better than I ever was, than I, you know, ever will be. Like, that's success. Um, and so when that option is taken off the table, at least for the moment, you know, it, it can be very discouraging. Um, but back to the, you know, to the, the question at hand, 
it wouldn't have changed anything. I mean, I've, I've got to believe God has a plan. I've got to believe that that Wheeler's here for a reason, that he was given to Judy and I, entrusted to Judy and I for a reason. Um, I just don't know what that is. So yeah. I, I quasi-joke, quasi-serious, uh, you know, say all the time, like, I know God's got a plan. I would really appreciate if he would clue me in on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, give, give me the cliff notes maybe, but, uh, dropping you know, hints. Like, <clears throat> just dropping hints, I guess. You know, that's what you hope. Yeah. You know, you know that's why that due yeah. time. Yeah. Is so, um, how's we, so Wheeler is, uh, he's five and a half. Um, and so the, the, the nature of the, of the disease is that, um, it is blindness. Is that, uh, what happens to most everyone who has this Batten's disease and then other, yeah, so other, the, the other sort of like things can be a, specific to the individual. Yeah. So the visual imperity, um, is the first physical manifestation manifestation of the disease, um, that they know, you know, that as far as they know, right. And so kids lose, lose their vision. Um, it can be fairly quick over the course of a couple months, you know, to a year. Um, and, and that is the, that's the first physical. So typically situations outside of ours where, where we knew and had him tested and got that early diagnosis. Um, typically that's the first flag that goes off for families. Kids are sitting there, they can't see, they're watching their pad close, they're, you know, all of a sudden things are blurry, you know, they they lose 25% of their vision or whatever it is, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. And that's what sends flags off. And that's what makes it difficult. And and the road to diagnosis so long is that, you know, as I said earlier, you go to your pediatrician, you go to your ophthalmologist, you go to this, you go to that. Everyone's looking for the obvious answer that doesn't exist. And, and the diagnosis of the disease is really this ultra rare disease that frankly, most, most medical practitioners haven't even heard of, Right. you know, right. Um, the, um, so you know, have... most pediatricians, if you went to them and asked them about juvenile Batten disease, they give you a blank stare. They'd have, they'd have to look it up. Yeah. They'd have to look it up. They may have heard about it. Maybe they read a journal. Maybe they were at a conference. They might say, yeah, I've heard of that before, but most of them aren't. They're not familiar. They're not. It's not going to come to mind when when a kid comes in with that to say, oh, let's test them for this ultra rare, you know, one in a hundred million disease. There's only 40 kids in the country, but let's go ahead and do this test just a minute. Like that's not even on the radar. Um, and so it it makes the road to diagnosis even longer which has major implications on on the success um the availability of data but also the the potential success of of treatments um in different therapies because all those data points are getting missed right, right. like they're, they're not being collected so for the longest time i mean we're really just into a window now um where there are other data points for Wheeler's age of other kids with, with juvenile Batten disease. Um, you know, for the first three, even four years, I mean, a lot of the data they were collecting, he, you know, it was him. It was the yeah. first time we were seeing it, you know, it was the first time. So that there's no way to, to, there's no way to, you know, to take his data and present it in a large scale because it's a data point of one, in which case you need multiple data points to confirm or, or you know, confirm or deny certain hypotheses, and, and a data point of one does not do that. Right. Is, is Wheeler right now, is, how's his vision? Uh, so his, his vision right now is, honestly, it's fairly good. good. Uh, it's anywhere, depending, depending on the test. Um, you know, and how cooperative he is. We we have it penned somewhere between uh uh 20 over 40 and 20 over 70. So it is below average. Um better than me. Below yeah. average, but not not where we worst case scenario thought he would be, you know, two, three, four, five years ago. 
Um, and, and so, yeah, so it, it's, we're, we're thankful right now, but, but it is, uh, below average. It is yeah. declining. Yeah. Um, do you wear glasses? Or contacts? Uh, so 20 over 40, 20 over 70 is just enough that he does have glasses. It is not enough for, for a five-year-old who's cognitively around a three and a half year old. Uh, it is not enough of a difference with the glasses on for him to see that to put up with wearing the glasses. Yeah, yeah, makes if sense. That makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I ran a I ran a summer camp. Yes, yeah, we have a special oh, guest. Oh my goodness! Uh oh, hey. hello, boy. Yes. You say hi to Mr. John. You say hi, Billy. Hey, wheels. Hey. Hi, wheels. They call you wheels because you're fast. Because you got because you, you got wheels. In, in Germany, they call them wheels. So I, I think your answer about, you know, why uh, God brought Batons into the Stegger's life is, you know, I would say a third of it's with Courtney, but the other two thirds is with Judy of, you know, if there's anybody who's going to move the needle on finding a cure or, you know, addressing this issue full on, it, it is uh, Courtney and Judy. Yeah. So in a way, um, yeah, yeah, we talked, uh, yeah, nobody wants it, but. They're, these are you're messing with the wrong couple yeah you're messing with the wrong family and network you know and you're just like <laughs> you, you you brought a knife to a, a gunfight for exactly, sure exactly right exactly right um so is um all right so that was great to see wheeler i don't think i don't think he was he at the tournament last year he was not at the tournament last year uh and all things uh going according to plan he will be there this year so, yeah, the, the plan is to have them, you know, the tournament's on October 14th, which is yeah. Columbus Day. Uh, so, you know, that'll Good. free up his schedule a little bit. And, you know, we hope, Perfect. again, that beautiful day. And we'll have him out there, you know, getting to know uh, the people that have his back. So that's a, a really important um, aspect in all of this uh, this journey for him is making sure that there's a community of support um, around him and yeah, you know he's able to live the best life that he can. Yeah, how does Courtney does uh, Wheeler? This is for anyone. You know, I don't. John, you can chime in or whatever. It's um, does he does he understand? Last year I was like, hey, he's four and a half. Does he understand his condition? algebra? <laughs> yeah, what the heck is that? <laughs> um, uh, does he understand that he has what he has his condition? No, he he doesn't. Or, or do you um... do you do you not? tell him i mean it's hard for him not to know when you're going to these different clinics or hospitals and stuff you yeah know? but so here's here's the thing and and you know we get this question a lot uh no he he's completely unaware um we haven't talked to him in terms of sat down one you know is cognitively about a three and a half year old he, he doesn't have the comprehension to understand what you were saying if you did talk to him um but in terms of you know all the you know he spends five weeks a year in different medical centers hospitals you know doing his his assessments updates tests all, all that kind of stuff and then additionally probably another i don't know 100 medical appointments a year um with all of his specialists and his teams but he's done that since he was four weeks old like that is his normal Mm -hmm. You know, he was at NIH for a week long assessment at five and a half weeks old. He did, you know, 30, 40, you know, probably 30 assessments, MRIs, EKGs, EEGs, uh, lumbar punctures, blood work, all of the therapies, neuro, you know, neurodevelopment, speech, swallow, OT, uh, psychiatry, all of these things he's done since he was five and a half weeks old. Um, and, and fairly regular at least every six months if, if not more so to him um you know to him you know it's pretty it was heartbreaking but this it's applicable to, to you know this conversation you know when he and i went to nih in june for his annual assessment um we walked in about 6 37 in the morning uh went to the day hospital uh, where we kind of post up for the day and then go to appointments from there. And he's been there so much. He's so comfortable. He ran into the room that we were in for the day 
uh, you know, the hospital room that we were for the day. And he was said, you know, he was like, I'm home. And he ran and jumped up on the bed and kicked his shoes off and completely unfazed. Like that's yeah. how comfortable he is in that environment. And while it's great that he's comfortable in that environment and it's a safe space, like no kid should have to walk into a hospital room and say, I'm home and, and be so comfortable in that environment that they treat it as if they're home. Like, mm-hmm. but, but that gives some insight into the regular occurrence that it's not uncommon for him. He It doesn't raise any flags in his head when we go to these medical appointments. Mm-hmm. That they're just a part of his normal life. Does he realize he's, he's different, though, than another five and a half year old? You know, that, that what he's going through is. You know, yeah. At, so, at, some, at some point, you know, he's going to. Uh, so why is jo- Johnny going to the doctor all the time? Yeah. So this is this is extremely subjective based off mine and. And Judy's observations, I think, yes, at, at some level, he is becoming aware. Yeah. Um, he he tends to not want to interact with kids his own age. He really gravitates towards older kids or he's really good with Reed. Our, our youngest is two and a half. He's really good with Reed, toddlers, or he wants to gravitate towards eight, nine, ten year olds. Somewhere where there is a big enough difference where he knows that they're different so that there isn't any awkwardness might not be the right word, but there isn't any awkwardness. Whereas when he interacts with kids his own age, he definitely gets more introverted, more shy, and and pulls back. Um, I think that is because he is aware of of things that are different yeah know, whether it's have... speech whether it's action actions throwing a ball yeah john i was no sorry didn't mean to interrupt but i would no, imagine you... that he's recognizing that there's an expectation amongst his peers of what his capabilities are and when he's not hitting it they probably look at him like why aren't you playing with the ball in the way i'm playing or why are you not speaking the way that i'm speaking and it seems like he's probably you know picking up on that does he uh, does he have um, outside the the vision? Is there any other symptoms that manifest? Yeah. So, um, you know, again, the, there's so little data to say what's what. Um, so, w- Wheeler has a long list. Uh, he has symptoms. So, this past summer, he received uh, his autism diagnosis. Um, He has a lot of symptoms that are very similar to autism. Uh, He received his autism diagnosis. Do we think he has autism? I I don't know. Um, But we know that that diagnosis, we know a lot of those supports that work for autism could potentially work for him. And so by doing that, he's the door has been opened wider for potential supports for him that, that could potentially help, um, ADHD. Um, he is sensory seeking and sensory sensitive. Um, and it's a very hard thing to balance when, which one is going to present itself. Um, you know, he goes from moments where when he's really worked up, he needs complete sensory input. I mean, he wants you to wrap him in a blanket. He wants you to hug him, to squeeze him. Um, he will lay on the floor and he will want you as an adult, me, to literally lay my entire body on top of him or Judy, you know, all 200 pounds of me, like that much sensory input, like he wants smothering him. But then he'll go in the pendulum will swing the other way where the the feeling of his clothes when he has worked up and he is spiraling out, just the feeling of his clothes is almost painful to him. So he has to get naked because he can't take in the sensory inputs that just his clothes are putting on it. Um, and so weird. it's a it's a very it's a tough balance. And yeah. and there is no rhyme or reason to when you know there are no triggers that you're that you say, okay, when this happens, he needs sensory input. I'm going to go wrap him in a blanket or when this happens, he's sensory sensitive. Like, I mean, they switch 
uh, you know, it changes with the wind. And so you just have to constantly be on your toes and adjusting um, to what he is in that moment. Yeah, that's, that's intense. I mean, yeah, it's intense. Um, in a way, it's, it's a weird superpower, you know, it's like to be able to pick up it's, I think to be able to pick up and sense things in the in the world is a high form of intelligence, you know. But if you can do that too much, you know, then it uh, yeah. there's there's a point where it turns into a, like you said, cuts the other way, double edged sword. You know, so uh, so other than that, he um, he's a normal or uh, other than that, a five and a half year old boy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm learning quickly that the term normal is is uh, is you know it's all relative um that we we get windows we get glimpses of quote unquote normal um interactions with his brother activities you know that he really enjoys things that he likes to do um you know mood swings or or happiness or you know he loves being outside he loves playing he loves climbing things uh he also loves his ipad um you know like i feel like most kids uh you know the ipad right now is is our biggest battle in trying to to find that balance between uh just letting him you know sit and watch versus having the battle of taking it away and forcing him to go do other stuff so um with wheeler it's it's everything is just emphasized right it, it's every transition is more difficult every mood swing is a larger swing uh every every task requires more attentiveness more thought to complete um i mean just you know getting him up in the morning and, and getting ready for school and then getting out to school seeing seeing the difference between reed our two and a half year old and wheeler and it's like night and day different the the level and the energy that has to go into just getting Wheeler out the door versus Reed where, you know, he's got his routine. You do this, boom, you pick him up, you throw him there. Um, so. Um, Cause there's, but he, but he there, does have moments. Is there like resistance you said, or um, he, uh, you said like mood swings and stuff there. So he can be, you everyone everyone's desire i think is to be kind of is, is consistent right but he has a hard time doing that correct it has a hard time with just uh, yeah trying to you know sticking with the task like all right let's get out of the house or you know five and a half you know we're going here did he, he throw a tantrum or whatever he's he, he's hard to kind of get get it to, get to go with the flow yeah so any anything uh Anything that isn't a preferred activity for him is a battle. I understand. Yeah. Um, but some days he's happy and he runs out and he hops on the bus and he's ready to go to school. Is that, so is, is the, that those preferred activities change? Yeah, frequently. You might not know if that's necessarily a, a symptom of the battens uh, that he's resistant to do things that he doesn't prefer. Um, is that a, have you heard stories about that with other cases? Yeah. So, so we have in, in, it's less about a stubbornness. It's more about the way that his brain processes, you know? And so we, Wheeler's, you know, it's really interesting with Wheeler. Like when you watch him, when, when he gets an idea about something that he wants to do or something that needs to happen or a way to do something, in in his mind, there is only one way. There are no alternatives. So there is no, or it's very difficult and it's a big battle if he's doing something wrong. Yeah, he's 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 biologically a, missing the ability to to, to see to see the other side or to, you know, yeah. He's missing it, that it's sort the of equivalent of saying like link in the brain. Yeah. And, and so so yesterday, uh, last night, we were at, at his, I had taken him to his, his private therapy, his, his OT um, therapy, and there was an obstacle course, you know, kind of a, a routine setup 
that um that Caitlin is his therapist who's phenomenal. She is an absolute angel. Um, but that she kind of like set up and he just wasn't having it, but he knew that we were trying to get him to do some form of an obstacle course, some form of routine. So he took us to another room and he started picking out these these swings, a, a flat kind of board swing, an inner two, and then uh, like a pull-up bar. <clears throat> and he put those out and then he put this long kind of uh, tube, stretchy tube through all of them and he created his own. And he did that for 15 minutes. He would start on one end and go over the swing and through the tube and do this. And so in his brain, we were trying to get him to do an obstacle course. And that wasn't the way that you do an obstacle course. It's like, I could do a better one. So he was fighting us and kicking and screaming because it wasn't the right way until we just stepped back and kind of said like, okay, let's watch him for a minute. And he ran to the other room and picked out the things that he wanted. And then he did the activities and he did the obstacle course. And he kept saying, I, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But that's because that, was in his brain of either what he wanted to do or how it was supposed to go. Yeah. In any variation from that was, was out of the realm of possible. It had to be done this way. And so it can be extremely frustrating because it can present itself as just a stubborn or, you know, just kind of a bratty kid or a stubborn kid, or he just wants it his way. But you, you have to step back and realize that it's not that he wants it his way. His way is the only way in his brain. Right. It's either this or, or death, essentially. Yeah. Like, th there is no alternative. It's just this. And, and for those of us, you know, that process normally, you know, we, we look at options. We look at, you know, variables or alternatives. And we have our plans of, let I want to go this way, but if you know, hey, we're going to go to D.C. without even thinking about it. We have a bunch of different variables, right? OK, well, 50 is going to be backed up. If 50 is backed up, I can swing down and go this way. And if that's backed up, I can go this way or stop here and take the metro. Whatever it is, there's always options. Wheeler's brain, there are no options. Yeah, I have to take 50 to get downtown. And if 50 is backed up, you just take a sledgehammer and break your way through right the, there are no alternatives there are no other routes to take it's not even a possibility mm -hmm. um and so when you think of it that way it, it helps it's... alleviate the frustration of dealing with him because you know it's not his fault he's right. just it's not intentional he just processes differently yeah it's it's a beautiful thing that he um realized that what you guys were trying to do and he's like uh let me, let me just do it i can do it better i can do a better obstacle course you know and went and then did it you know um that's pretty that's a, that's a smart it's it's smart of him you know um, it, it is but i'll i'll just push back a little bit right there it's not that he can do a better obstacle course yeah that was, I was yeah, we wanted him around. to do an obstacle course and the only way to do an obstacle course oh, was, was way. this way and I know that that's kind of a that may sound petty, but but that's the difficulty in dealing right. with Wheeler is realizing like it's not that there's a different way or a better way that he wants to do it or he just wants to do these activities. In his brain, there is only one way. And so it's helping him figure out with every activity. And I mean, this is this is everything. This is every test. This is breakfast every morning. Mm -hmm. Figuring out what he wants that day and how to go about doing it. Does so, he want milk? Does milk belong in cereal today or does it not? Like every, even the most simple of process, um, you know, when you're getting him dressed, does his shirt go on first today or does his underwear and his pants go on first today? Something as simple as that can set him off because whatever is in his head for that in that moment needs to happen, needs to happen in that order. Courtney, would you, if you didn't have the diagnosis, you know, virtually on day one, where do you think you would be now? Would doctors have come to this conclusion or would you guys still be searching for 
uh, no, I, so the motivations. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there, there's, we, we talk to a number of families and, you know, and people ask us a lot, like, I don't want to say what would you prefer because it sounds weird, but essentially for the sake of this conversation, you know, like, would you prefer to have the diagnosis as early as you did? Or, that, that was my follow-up question. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad or, that you're jumping or, right in. Or do you feel like it's encapsulated your life and you would have preferred to kind of been in the oblivious na- naive? Yeah. Um, you know, and like, I, I don't know how to answer that because I don't, we've never known Wheeler with that. We've, we have, 28 days with Wheeler without a diagnosis. What I can say is looking at the struggle and talking to other families of not having a diagnosis and the battles they went through thinking it was just a learning disability. Is it behavior? Am I a bad parent? Like, why is my kid just acting up all the time? Why are they refusing every single task that I'm giving them? Why are they not sleeping why are they not eating you know all of these things and not having an answer to that i'm i'm glad that we have an answer because i i i don't know where my physical or mental state would be if we didn't have a diagnosis and and something to at least guide us um without a diagnosis i mean i pretty much would probably just feel like the worst parent in the world. Not yeah. Oh, I just know from my perspective, you know, you list some of these things and a lot of them are more extreme, but I have a five-year-old and a yeah. uh, four-year-old as well. Uh, you know, this doesn't sound like every day in my household, but some of it doesn't. So I can imagine that you're like, why, why is he acting this way? You know, I ask that question of my son all, all the time. And um, yeah, I imagine that there is some solace and some comfort in having that diagnosis as, as uh, detrimental as that is. Yeah, I mean, at, <clears throat> at, at the most basic level, and this sounds selfish, but at the most basic level, his diagnosis at least provides Judy and I some comfort that it's not us. Like that, that. We don't know what the right answers are, but we're at least doing the right thing and trying to push to to help him. Because like you said, I mean, a lot of the times you see him, and frankly, if, if people don't know Wheeler and they see his actions, he looks, he can present like just a spoiled or, you know, a, a, a five-year-old. Just a difficult kid difficult kid but there yeah, are plenty of needs, those that needs I, discipline you know he needs discipline yeah and, his parents know, let him boundaries. get away with stuff yeah yeah or or you know why are you letting your you know and wheeler's huge i mean he looks like he's six or seven years old so it's like why is that seven-year-old laying on the ground having a tantrum in the middle of the store like you know so we we get the looks all the time from other from other Arch. people i'm sure those are delightful that's um, right yeah I'm unfazed by them. I've, I've hit the point where I just can't care. Um, you know, you got to get to that point. Because I have two options. I can either educate them or I can move on with my life. Yeah. So if I'm really feeling punchy, you know, maybe I'll give them a bracelet, you know, with Wheeler's website on it. Maybe I'll explain a little bit about it. Um, invite them to go play golf. Invite them to go play golf. Yeah. Um, and, and uh you know, but most of the time I just go on my way. Um, yeah. You know, probably never going to see him again, you know, but, but you get that a lot because it's not an extreme. And when you look at Wheeler, I mean, you saw him, you know, just briefly, but you know, when you look at Wheeler, your first instinct is like, your first instinct is not, Oh my God, that kid has obviously has a, a yeah. really awful, terrible terminal neurodegenerative disease like that that's not the physical manifestation and so from an outside looking in it just looks like behavioral issues or it looks like you know potentially you know discipline or whatever that may be because it doesn't present like down syndrome or some of the more visible you know disabilities not, yeah, yeah not at his age i mean it 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 will um you know it it certainly will but it doesn't it's not right now. How how does it, if you don't mind, um, 
how does it progress? Uh, it so mm -hmm. let me know if I'm wrong here, but um, so people with patents, their expectancy is into their teens, right? Uh, maybe yeah, mid, mid maybe to late early, teens. Okay, that's their life expectancy. Um, how does it how does it progress? If you don't mind. Um. Yeah. So it. It mainly affects the, you know, the nervous system, right? And so because it is neuro, um, but it, it predominantly affects the nervous system. And so um, there's actually a good synopsis. So I'm going to I'm going to just read this off because uh, this is what's on his website. And this is the most uh, concise uh, description, but. CLN3 juvenile bad disease is an ultra-rare fatal inherited disorder that primarily affects the nervous system. Children with CLN3 um, develop normally until ages four to six years old when progressive vision loss becomes noticeable. Uh, typically within two to three years after symptom onset, total vision loss occurs, uh, seizures begin, declining speech and progressive loss of motor coordination where eventually children become wheelchair bound, bedridden, and die in their late, um, mid to late teens. Um, and so, as as the brain begins to decline and shut down, it has different impacts, um, different physical manifestations. Right. So there there are children that have severe epilepsy to the point that it completely handicaps their lives. They have multiple seizures in a day you know, on a regular basis, there are other children that have maybe one seizure a year or every couple of years, and they're on a good medication, you know, regimen that, that keeps those seizures at bay. Um, there are children where uh, the muscular aspects decline, where they've lost the, the motor skills to walk, they have scoliosis, and, and the skeletal systems are actually breaking down um cognitive decline all of the all pretty much all of the kids are, are capped from a cognitive standpoint um you know it's somewhere between eight and ten eight and twelve years old eight and ten really from a cognitive standpoint their their brain will never develop past that point so so, so you're saying that those are wheeler's best days when he's eight or eight or nine that's kind of peak wheeler in the course of history eight or nine years yeah no i mean realistically wheeler's best day is today really every every you know we're still at the point where his best day is today um sometime in the near future his best day will be yesterday mm -hmm. ah, um, so he's still pro still progressing he's still growing he's not but he's not declining i understand so he's he's plateaued at the moment we're in a battle and we're trying to figure out how we jumpstart essentially his brain and get him into a regimen that opens him up to continued development but but cognitively he's he's plateaued over the last nine to 12 months where the, there has not been any substantial if any cognitive growth mm -hmm. which is very difficult because you know, and this goes, John, to your question about whether it's better to know. Um, you know, it's not good news hearing that that his brain is not developing um, or that it's plateaued. It does provide a little bit of relief to Judy and I because we spend a substantial amount of our lives focused on helping him grow and develop. We spend financial money which is why we're beyond grateful for you know the gain invitational and for john and carissa and all of those that put into it um you know in private therapies i mean he does private speech therapy uh you know once a week every monday uh, that he actually does on horseback um because the horse putting him on a 1500 pound horse uh meets his sensory needs and allows him to be open to his speech therapy so the horse literally just that movement that interaction that feeling makes him comfortable enough and provides enough sensory inputs 
that he is then open to doing the speech therapy. Um, he does private OT. And, and so when, when we went six, nine months and we were not seeing any progress, and I mean, our, our home, it's not, we aren't constantly doing activities with him to the point where it seems like work or therapy to him, but we, we have a number of, of really smart people, really creative people on, on team Wheeler, uh, that are always providing activities, right? Things that he would consider play or fun, but they have this additional benefit of being therapeutic, right? They are going to help with his fine motor. They're going to help with his speech. They're going to help with his developmental aspects. They're going to push him, but in, but to him, it's just, you know, it's certain, it's different activities to play. And so we're always doing different activities to, to try and help push him, to help him grow. And over the last year, we haven't seen any growth in those areas. And it's really demoralizing. And it, it makes you feel like you're not doing the right things. We haven't tried the right things. What are we missing? What Where are we failing him? So at least knowing that the brain has kind of plateaued or, or isn't developing as quickly, you know, as a traditional five-year-old brain, at least provides some relief to me and, and hopefully to Judy to be like, okay, it's not you guys. It's not that you're not trying hard enough, but we can't expect his, we can't expect his speech. We can't expect his other skills to develop if the brain is not developing as well. Um, and so it, it does provide, again, it provides enough of a relief to be like, all right, it's not me. Like I'm doing all I can and I need to keep doing what I can, um, but not get demoralized, uh, thinking that I've failed him by not doing the right things or not doing enough. Like we just need to keep pushing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, it, um, is he still, so last year when we talked, he was on a trial, right? You're taking some sort of trial medication. The, the first therapeutic medication for Batten's disease was developed really recently, right? Last couple of years. Is that right? Uh, for, for CLN3 specifically. For CLN, yeah, specifically. So you have, you have, you have to a treat of medications and, and treatments and, and different things for other mutations, uh, CLN1 through, you know, 14, but, but for CLN3, this is the only uh, potential treatment, and he's in a. Uh, he is currently in an off. He has an off-label prescription for this medication. Medication passed phase one uh, at the FDA. Uh, that I believe it's the safety um, safety trial, and it is currently um, waiting to go to phase two, three. Uh, at the FDA, but is uh, suspended indefinitely due to funding. Um, so BBDF, like uh, Beyond Bad Disease Foundation, which is where Wheeler's uh, Wheeler's research fund um, is through, and um, they are they they are the the pioneers, the champions that have been working with with the drug company to really. Hey. And that's the group that we support through the uh, the charity golf tournament as well. In addition yep. to the, to the stackers directly. Yep. Thank you, John. I was I was going to. I got a lot of plugs in. I got a lot of. I got a list full of plugs here. Yeah. So. Good. Plug <laughs> plug them everywhere. But but yeah, you know, like John said, I mean that that's that's who we're working with. That's who Re Wheeler's research fund is towards. And right now, the funds are going towards pushing this trial. Um, bad. It's called but, Beyond Batten's Disease, BBD. Beyond Batten, Batten Disease Foundation, yeah, yeah BBDF. Um, and, and that's where Wheeler's uh, research fund is towards. So is um, it like, is, is it the, the medication uh, is past the first phase? How long has it been stuck here not unfund, not with not enough funds? How long has it been in purgatory? So to speak? I'm going to say about a year. Yeah. So that, that basically you have it to... It might be like eight months. Is it as simple? Um, is it as simple as that? Like, all right, if you got BBD, the tournament, people across the country that are fighting uh, to raise money for the Batten's research, if you get to a certain number, if it's like say, say fifty million, then we'll start the next phase. Is that what it is? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we need eight. We need eighteen million dollars. Eighteen million is a number. Yep. We're a really good lobbyists to get the money. 
Yeah. You know a few of those, I think. Yeah. Um, Let's go. Yeah, I mean, we need, we need a, you know, BBDF, we need $18 million to get this pushed into the next phase of the trial. I understand. But you so, are, but he's taking the medication regard or, or uh, off label. Uh, yeah, so uh, he, he has an off label uh, prescription. Giant um, brand. Yeah, we all need off label. Yeah, yeah. He, he's got an off label um, prescription right now while this, because it's not currently FDA approved. Um, it, Judy and all of her might um, has managed. We are now in the second year that that our insurance has agreed to cover this, yes. which is incredible. Um, <sighs> because it ranges from twenty four to twenty eight thousand dollars a month. Um, wow, it's about that's for ninety pills. It's about three hundred fifty dollars a pill. That could be a whole other pot. Thousand dollars a day. Yeah. Um, which is, as you can imagine, without that insurance coverage, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of golf tournaments. Yeah, it's a lot of golf tournaments. Yeah, <laughs> my game will get a lot better. That's mm-hmm. for sure. Your pocket, pocket book will get a I lot mean, better. <laughs> yes, there, aren't too. Of, <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of families that have an extra three hundred thousand dollars a year lying around just to throw on on some some medication. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's a pretty big mountain to climb. So. Yeah. I remember last year, the second year of, of, of our insurance, um, approving that and covering it. Um, but in February, I mean, it's year by year. We didn't, we don't know, you know, what, what they'll do next year. I understand. At least you have the solace of a year, you know, um, but then every February is going to roll around again, or in the, in the new year. It's, it's, it, every year is a contract get, year. So. Get nervous. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. Hopefully, uh, just kind of stays as is. And um, so, so this this medication that um, it's off label, whatever. It's it's basically the same thing, I guess, as the one they're trying to approve. Um, but you're you don't know if it's actually working, correct? For another like year at least. I remember if this from that, last year. Yeah, I mean, if if that, um, I mean, and because the window, because the windows and the timelines for, so because there's so many different possible symptoms with, with every kid that has CLN3, right? Like, there's no guarantee, other than the visual imperity. The visual imperity, the blindness is the only is the only constant across all of the juvenile patent disease kiddos. Um, outside of that, there, there's this huge menu of potential symptoms, and there's no rhyme or reason, there's no predictive measure to say which ones are going to impact Wheeler or and, which ones. And there's no way to gauge how he would be without the medication, I imagine. And there's also no way to gauge how he would be without it. Um, we have these large buckets that say, okay, you know, there, there's data that says, okay, out of all the CLN3 patients we've had, they have all lost their vision by 10 years old. Wheeler's five and a half. He started the med- medication um, about three months before his fourth birthday. Um, there's no way to know if he was going to lose his vision at five or if he was going to lose it at six or seven or eight or nine. And so there's no way for us to say for sure that the medication is working. Now, if he still has his vision at seven, he still has his vision at eight, at nine, you know, as we get closer, the impacts and and the severity of the symptoms, we can start making those assumptions um, and start making assumptions as to where we think we're seeing successes and start tracking that against data with with other kids so the but the, the fact of the matter is we've got to get everyone we've got to get all the cln3 kiddos on miglosat one way or another best way to do that is we need to get it through the fda get it fda approved get insurances to cover this and get every every cln3 kiddo on this drug yeah, yeah and did. frankly right now it's the only thing it's the only thing in the world when wheeler was diagnosed five years ago there were four potential four potential treatments and I think one or two potential gene therapies today there's nothing nothing how come there's one one potential treatment 
and that's being held up because of funding and bureaucracy with the FDA. So those four, that's the only thing. those four potentials when you got diagnosed or five, whatever it is, they went away because of lack of money. Lack of funding, lack of funding. you know, re reprioritize, reprioritization of, uh, of funding. Uh, yeah. They weren't successful, you know, what, whatever it may be. I mean, you, you've, you've got to remember, I mean, these drug companies and these family organizations like BBDF, I'm, they put hundreds of millions of dollars into a single drug, you know, and, and, and it is a heavy investment to gamble, right? So you're, you're risking, you're gambling that you're going to invest X amount. And at the end of the day, it's going to be successful and therefore you'll see a return on that investment in excess of what you invested. That excess allows drug companies to then pay for other research R&D drugs. Um, but at some point, the pool dries up if, if you're not making progress, if it's not you know, advancing quickly enough. So if if it's not advancing quickly enough or if the potential for success diminishes past a threshold, they just, you cut your losses and you move on to a different disease or a different drug or a different, you know, yeah. effort. Um, and so, um, by the way, that's me speaking very high level and that is my personal opinion, not, mm -hmm. not the opinion. Of, not representative of the, the gain invitational or anybody like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not any of the drug companies or whatever, but that's just the fact of the matter. Like drug companies can't continue to just hemorrhage money on something that they don't see as being successful or something where they're not going to get a return on that investment. Um, you know, that return on investment and in, in excess is what funds other R and D efforts. I mean, it gives you, um, <clears throat> In a way, it's like it takes you out of the driver's seat. You know, you don't have to. You're he's a good job. You and Judy, obviously, of getting the insurance. You know, like that is, this, that is all good job. That's Judy. that's that's like the most important. The only way to treat it is with this drug that we know. Of. That's the only way to do it. So if the, yeah, the, even, the main the main even then it's not even then it it is best case scenario. It is a treatment. It's a, a temporary treatment. It's not a cure. Right. It's not going to. It's not going to save his. It's not going to give him his, another gene that he's missing or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 not going to. It's also not going to. Recover any lost attributes. Like mm -hmm. it's not going to be able to go back in time and fix his vision. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be able to go back in time and and regenerate lost brain cells. Yeah, it's a band aid. Um, so, but yeah. that's the only thing, that's the only your only option, you know. It's not like you're pulling your, you're pulling your hair out. You won, you won the insurance battle. It's, it's it's being covered, however much it is. Um, and there's that's there's no much really more you can do besides get as many people out to the golf and try to raise money and and create more awareness, right? Yeah. Um. So that in a way, it's like I would think you know you've done all you can do, you know, even though you're you're takes the, the reins out of your hands nah i don't know what else we can do but just yeah just love up on them keep doing but, it keep keep but, them. Uh, but I'm, whatever, I'm talking about from a med we... medical standpoint from medical you know what i'm saying yeah yeah um yeah i mean th there's yeah from my my perspective my skill set i mean i've i've tapped out um uh -huh. You know my expertise. Yeah. yeah. No, There's Judy. A... Judy is a whole different. She's a whole, uh, a whole different animal. You know, yeah. like she's, she knows where to push. She's got ideas and, in, in, you know, a lot of irons and fire. Um, Don't sell yourself uh, short. You're still an incredible advocate, obviously for Wheeler, but but the disease as well. So. Yeah. Well, Everyone's got their talents, man. Everyone's got their talents. You know. Um, yeah, I'm just good at bringing a hundred people together to uh, play golf and raise a couple bucks. Talk so about that. Talk that's about the that. limit of my capability. Uh, that's that's, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. Since, since yeah, since Courtney stepped away, we'll mention yeah. some of our sponsors. Kevin Murphy. I don't know if you know Kevin. He's one I of uh, our, you know mutual friend of me and Courtney, known yeah. independently. 
a uh, really great guy. He's our sp- uh, lead sponsor on the event. And then uh, I got a list of people who have helped over the years, you know, Pat Casey and Marissa Casey and Georgetown events. Um, yep, yeah. Our friend, Pat Huge judge supports. Yes. Uh, our friend, Pat judge is stepping up and beltway cleaning. Um, and then Cordy talk about wars. And I really love that group who supports the tournament as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wars and, uh, you know, wars and end wars and yeah yeah the, my maryland uh, accent so doesn't help josh, with that word yeah josh josh has become a you know a close friend um and uh close friend and just a huge supporter of our family and, and particularly wheeler um josh is a a, a a military veteran he and i met through a different uh through a different organization that we've both been a part of, uh, War Heroes on Water, which is a, a, the largest nonprofit sport fishing tournament in the world. So uh, it's actually happening this weekend, uh, but they're they're all flying out there uh, today and tomorrow. I'm not going this year. It'll be the first time in six years that I haven't gone out there, but it's just a really great event. Where is it at? One of the best part, um, California. So they leave out of Newport Beach and go spend three days on these incredible boats fishing uh, Catalina and San Clemente. Um, but one you of the, the New- Newport, parts, I'll be fine. You don't need to yeah. put me on the boat. Just give me to Newport, and I'm so yeah, it's it's a pretty beautiful place. The weather's pretty much always perfect. Um, everyone's relaxed. The oh, the pace God. of life out there. Every time I go out there, I mean, I'm coming from DC, and it's yeah, turn 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 turn, and everybody's like. <laughs> you're in California, like you're in Newport, like slow down. Like, yeah, Washingtonians um, don't thrive there with uh, yeah. our attitude. Uh, but, but all of that to say, um, one of the, the best parts is just the people that I've met through that. And Josh is one of the other vets. Um, so when he retired from the military, he he's now started his own company, Wars In. And he does these incredible custom boards, um, you know, cheese boards and, and different things. So I don't know if you remember last year, but like the winners um, and some of the sport boards and stuff like that, Josh did those wars end. Yeah, um, real sharp looking. And he's uh, he's done those again this year for for the tournament. So winners, runners up and 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 um, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, not, you know, silver lining is a strong word, but. You know, it's brought a lot of people closer to Courtney, um, you know, addressing this issue. And, you know, you get to see the, the good in a lot of people. And, you know, I see it on my end of the folks that uh, participate in the tournament and the, the folks that love the stackers and don't know exactly how to how to support. You know, everybody wants to do something good. Um, you know, folks, all parents need uh, time and money. Um, and obviously, you know, the way that court courtney has laid out uh wheeler's situation it's uh, you know it, it's more dramatic than the average family so um you know i think we've got a good collection of folks who are supportive um you love to grow it through like you know your network billy um mm-hmm. and, and other folks who've been regulars at the tournament because everyone walks away you know it's a nice day of golf and supporting a good cause you know courtney talked to them they'll get to meet wheeler this year judy um you know tells people what the situation is and and i think you know there's some level of good but it's hard to it's hard to measure given the parameters that courtney's talked about it, the rarity yeah. of the disease and um uh, you know just the odds that they're up against um but you know we continue to fight and continue to do what we do yeah uh, um i think it's uh with you i guess john if you um other other is the is the field full you said 100 no that's no a lot of that's a lot of golfers yeah, you know, we ended up with around 88 last year, um, which is a nice number. I don't like these 150 person tournaments where it's seven hours to play. That's not what we're the objective of what we're yeah. trying to do. Yeah. Uh, we're we're trying to get a real solid core of around 100. Um, you, you know, make a little money off the registration, but make sure we have as many sponsors as we can, um, and, and make sure that you know the folks who are attending are aware of our sponsors and that that they're part of this cause as well. Um, so that's the objective these days. So, you know, Billy, I'll ask you again to kind of spread it wide and far. Um, and, and we look forward to seeing you out there. Are you playing with Timmy Connolly again or oh, yep, trying to are. get a real partner? 
<laughs> I'm no, joking. T- Timmy and I will we'll probably be uh, barefoot again at per yeah. usual. You know, that's about right. You were uh, talking about re re listening to some of your old pods, and I was listening to, to Timmy's. I think I only listened about half of it from a year ago or whenever he was on your show. Yeah, yeah. Um, real right. impactful. You know, it's a guy I know really well, but uh, listening to him, you know, on on your format is uh, was really beneficial. The insights of him and and other people that you've had on your show. So I'm really grateful for. The, you, the legends like Courtney Stecker and others and you know Billy Gladding and some some folks yeah. I've known forever it it brings a new light on people that I uh it kind of like I've, you know, I've known for you decades know, you know it doesn't, it doesn't a lot of the know, tough stuff or the, it, deep stuff or intimate stuff doesn't come up playing golf you know or or at a bar or at a dinner um, yeah our, our usual haunts you know yeah, you exactly you need to talk to Fa- Father Garish yeah uh it's cool to as the, the platform can kind of afford just to allow um people to talk about stuff that um that that it's really close to your soul obviously this one for sure close to your heart um because uh it's it, it, often, almost every time i do it I, I i end the thing like in a better mood than when i began it you know because i i'm i gotta get in there too i gotta get deep as well you know so it's like it's cathartic you know therapeutic you know, to an extent um but um Oh, so there's still golfers, right, John? Yeah, uh, yeah. If still you wanted to golf, but also sponsor opportunities, sponsorship opportunities. You know, we have other Lily Harris, Aaron Gallagher, Mike Ness, Dan Schuler, uh, the attorney, or not the attorney, the uh, the realtor, uh, the folks at the Beer Institute, Annie Lang, especially uh, my sister Courtney Gain, uh, another great Courtney in the world, and her that's husband, great Courtney. That's right. Yes, that's right. they're great supporters. The folks at Scarlet Oak. Which do you guys know about Scarlet Oak, the bar down by uh, the Navy Yard? No. It, it, I'm getting the sense. Yeah, we're too old, but I'm getting the sense that's <laughs> kind of like the Smith Point of the era. Uh, it, I got some guys in their 20s who work for me, and that's that's their haunt. And uh, you know, it seems like the Georgetown has moved down that way in terms of the demographic, and that seems to be the place that most people hang out at. But they'll never. There's only one Smith Point. There's only one Chai Dai, George's, all that. But those are our there? memories. Are we- is that the 19th hole for us or what? Are we go heading down there after the tournament? I don't think most people at the tournament are welcome there anymore, but we'll see. Uh, we're not on the list. Oh, are you talking about Scarlet Oak? No, <laughs> the no, Scar- no, no we're going to Scarlet Oak. Nobody's Oak. welcome at Scarlet Oak. Nobody's uh, welcome <laughs> at Smith Point or, or any of the old uh, stomping grounds. Haunts, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, all right. And uh, what I was going to say is, oh. I'll mention Bert- Brian McClintock. Yeah, yeah, please go. The Canes, the Keep Crescent going. family, McGivney. I was with Robert Ransom last night, the great Robert Ransom, and um, he's gonna he can't play, but he's gonna uh, help out Kunish Industries. Lucky Buns, our friends over there, Gus and Alex, and um, Apira Technologies. So, um, and just heard from a woman, Marissa Meyer, uh, excuse me, Marika Meyer, who's an interior designer. She's gonna help out as well. She's gonna do uh, the longest drive or the driving range. I haven't seen the email just came in and I'm too focused on this conversation to, <laughs> to recognize exactly what happened there, but good group of people, always fun. Um, you know, try and make it low key, but make sure the objective is clear and, and that folks recognize what value that, uh, their contributions provide. Amen. Um, I was going to say, uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the event. Um, but, uh, it's a good thing that Courtney, that you're going through this, I guess, right. Maybe now as versus like, uh, or I, I, you, you've been going through it for like about five years, but let's say five years prior to that, you know, the, the, the future, you probably didn't realize it back then. Right. For, uh, if you have the disease is pretty bleak. Um, now it's a little bit more brighter, you know, with this. Well, this, thanks to that, Courtney. This, I this, think this yeah. development. Yeah. And- um, say it again, say it again, John. I said thanks to the Steckers. Uh, yeah, you know that there is a little more optimism, I imagine, in, in the world because of them. Yes, hundred percent. But also optimism with this, this, this the disease. Uh, there's a, there's a way to treat it now. And then, like looking forward. No, who knows? We talked about it. I'm a I'm a huge optimist with respect to future and technology and stuff. Like it, it it's developing so uh, like blurringly fast. Um, and we talked last. Um, year about Neuralink and what Elon Musk is doing with that sort of implant in the brain. I don't know if that would be a benefit for this situation, but they're they're walking back and reworking a lot of things that you're like, hey, you're never going to walk again. Hey, you're never going to be able to move your arm again. Hey, you're never going to be whatever again. And uh, and it's 
prom the, the future is promising and in a way time is can be your best friend and it can be horrible as well but uh you know that i just listened to a, a podcast uh i'm a big rogan fan he had the first Neuralink person on there um and he also had musk on Musk like 10 years like most people will have a Neuralink implant in their brain even like normal people like there's this this, this movement toward you know they're not going to turn out like google glasses <laughs> no no um but there's no, but this, I mean, that, a, a incredible movement a, incredible you know, movement i think you know it's such a big point like technology year over year technology is expanding at an exponential rate yeah. like what it was five years ago what it was 10 years ago um you know the options the possibilities the technology that it, it, it's just all blowing up there there's mm -hmm. there's a lot more opportunity um a lot more potential for success today than there was five years ago yep um than there was 10 years ago than there was 15 you know and, you know, just since Wheeler's diagnosis, so in June when we were at NIH, they did two new evaluations within this year that were just added this year uh, to the protocols. One of them is, and again, I'm not a scientist or a researcher. This is how they gave me the dumbed down version. But it basically is this helmet. It shoots these uv lights into his brain and the way that the light reflects or refracts off the brain and, and the way that the light comes back tells them where the brain is using energy and how much sugar the brain is processing while it uses energy it, it it's insane it's insane and so it's like uh it's crazy to think that 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 can that exists now five years ago that wasn't on the table hey we're going to shoot these lights into the brain and see how your brain's working you know like in and pull out different data points you know with regards to energy and sugar and other things um and so so that leads to our optimism right yeah yeah if that's something new is it going to work i don't know it might it might not right but those ideas are being generated yes the desire yeah. the drive to impact change is there yep and hopefully a, a year from now we'll be talking about again because we're going to do it every year um until we cure that disease uh, and then we'll figure out something else to play golf for um <laughs> But uh, next year, hopefully, we're talking again, and then talk about another sort of something science fiction that's actually that's actually science now. Um, that yeah. could help, you know. Um, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, it's yeah. And we'd like to pick on somebody else besides Batten when when they're all done. But exactly, they'll have, they'll have a ways to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we're, 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 I think you guys are doing particularly Courtney and and Judy and all um, as as much as you can. You know uh, that. In some so some sort of way that gives that should give you some some peace you know that's all you can do it's hard to measure it's like did i really try my best in the game well, like i don't know like you just gotta have that feeling that you're you're doing all you can and if you don't when you don't know what to do i would just i don't know give them a hug but don't hug them too long because the sense is what you know, it don't give sense sense we overload you know um anyway no i mean the the john and carissa i mean we we're very lucky yeah. Judy and I and Wheeler and, and Reed, um, you know, we we have an absolutely incredible support system um, that, frankly, a lot of people don't have. Um, but, yeah. you know, at, at, at the top of that list is definitely John and Carissa. I mean, we're, we're beyond grateful for their friendship, Amen. their love, their support. Um, they have been a constant um they've been a constant from day one so um yeah we we love doing this tournament as you mentioned it it's always just a fun tournament john put the weather order in We're gonna have <laughs> today. Uh, the course the course is ready you know we're getting the sponsors in line we're getting the teams lined up um 
you know, everything about it, it's just going to be another amazing day. Um, but beyond just the golf, it, it, it's a way that Judy and I get energized by the family and, and the friends and the support that we have. And it's a way that we get to fill our tanks to, to keep the fight going. Amen. Yep. Amen. Yeah, Courtney and Judy are always there day one when Chris and I have issues. So it's the only way that we can return the favor is to be, you know, as supportive as we can. Friendship, maybe, you know, but don't mess with love. No, love's, no. love's <laughs> is typically undefeated. You know, it finds a way to, to make it happen, you know, um, anyway um anything else uh, i've done all the plugs i think i need to do <laughs> um but you know really I'll just plug, put it on I'll plug that on folks if if your swing's no good hopefully your checkbook is and um we'll, yeah. we'll find a way to get your name out there and yeah. uh m make sure you're you're known as somebody who's part of a you know this this challenging cause but a great cause at the same time and uh you know just want a, a bigger network um of support even though it's it's great it's it's deep and it's great but it needs to be deeper and mm -hmm. um you know the, the needle that needs to be moved that uh courtney was stressing is you know 18 million dollars uh for a funded trial and you know a million other things and wheeler's immediate needs those aren't insignificant so um there's work to be done and this is just one one piece of the whole uh, gigantic puzzle mm -hmm. let's make it a big piece right Yep. Um, awesome. Uh, Courtney, anything, anything further? Uh, what's the website? Uh, website is, uh, well, Wheeler's website is, uh, www.wheelerswarriors.org. Um, and then within that, um, there's a tab to the gain invitational 2024, but then John, do you have the link? I have my email address, which is J F I T Z G A I N E at gmail.com, which I can get you squared away pretty quickly if you reach out to me and uh, put that in all the podcast description yeah. and all that jazz. If you don't It'll be in the mind, right. William, <laughs> I can yes. do it. I can do it. <laughs> Copy paste. Um, all right, cool. Uh, I just, one thing, I don't know, kind of hit me, Courtney. I think you and Judy are heroes in the extent i don't know if you knew it at the time we didn't touch we talked last time about this but how you guys you know, had a, a difficult time process getting pregnant you and you got pregnant um and then you or i don't know the order but you both knew you got tested and you both knew it's kind of an odd test that not many people will usually take when trying to get pregnant i think yeah um, um but you got tested and you realize that you are you are oh boy there goes beethoven you're you are carriers of this of this gene right or this condition um and uh usually parents with kids they don't know that their kid has battens like right until four or five years old but since you guys got tested now that opens up a whole nother like now they have so much more data you know like better term or whatever yep, data though um through wheeler as to what the this, what the thing looks like between the ages of zero and four you know so, amen to you, you two for 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 doing that. You know that's that's huge. That's that's that's, that's you know. Courtney, is it one of the objectives? You know, when we were we Carissa was pregnant, uh, they have a battery of tests they do, and you know, Batons is not on that that list. Is that something that uh, is that an objective of the organization or, or researchers is to put? You know, there's funny, not funny. None of these diseases are funny, but there's maple syrup disease. There's uh cystic fibrosis there's like a dozen or 20 things on there that they usually yeah. test for yeah i mean there, there's hundreds i mean ideally early diagnosis would would exponentially increase data points and and the ability to make progress within this disease right mm -hmm. um especially because of how rare the disease is early diagnosis would would allow for just more data which yeah. is, as we know, you know, especially within the pretty much in every aspect of, of our lives, but especially within the medical world, I mean, data, data drives all like you've yeah. got to have the data, um, you know, it, it confirms, you know, hypotheses. It also it also tells you you're going down the wrong path and you need to recalculate. Um, so that that would certainly I don't think it's one of the top priorities, but it's something we talk about a lot. 
um, it's something that would be very beneficial. Um, so I, I don't know what the steps are to make that a reality, but it's some, certainly something that would be beneficial. And it's something that we, we discuss a lot on, on how do we push that. That's uh, yeah. The, re the reality is that, it, <clears throat> well, it, the field, the uh, science is only really data points are Wheeler, right? For, from, for that young of kid. Um, so what you guys, your decision to get tested or whatever, and then um, with the hypothetical question, like, would you want, would you want to know later or from the beginning? I, I'd say, I want to know the truth from the beginning um, because if, you know, because you do, you, 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 he had it from the beginning, it's given the rest of the Batten community and the medical community um, only but a, a benefit, you know, like more data, you know, so you've already given back in a huge way. It's also, I mean, it's also allowed us to intercede on Wheeler's behalf at a much earlier age. Yep. You yeah. know, we were able to start therapies earlier to really push. We were able to, you know, there, there's a number of benefits. Um, fundraising. Like right right now, I mean, we use very little of the the money that is raised for for Wheeler. Most of it's going to a you know a special needs trust because at some point insurance is going to say no to paying for things. Yeah. At some yeah. point we're going to need a forty thousand dollar hospital bed. At some point we're we might need a wheelchair accessible van. At some point we may need, you know, <clears throat> um right after we we did the first tournament how wheeler got on this this drug you know we called the doctor blah blah blah. they were at texas long wait list um they called back and said hey we can get you in to see you know this doctor on whatever it was wednesday or thursday can you be here in two days because of john and carissa and the gain invitational and and all of our supporters that have contributed we had the funds available to buy last minute flights to houston get hotels get a rental car and not have to worry about that like we we had funds available to hop on a plane and go and that appointment is what led to wheeler getting on this medication um that's yeah. because of john and carissa and, and you guys and everybody yeah. and everybody who who contributes that we had the ability, we had the funds to say, okay, let's spend two thousand dollars on flights because it's last minute. But Wheeler needs to be in Texas in two days. Let's go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but right. but we do know we do know rainy days are in the future. But because of this, we've been able to get a head start on creating that that those funds. You know. Things, medical needs are not cheap. Um, and, and so there will be a point, like I said, when insurance says no, or when when we need things um, that are more, you know, more substantial, more expensive, substantial. Um, and, and so having that cushion of knowing that we can provide for Wheeler and we're going to be able to address his needs removes a massive, massive anxiety and concern of mine and, and Judy's um, that allows us to be able to focus our energy and our uh, effort elsewhere. Yeah. I'm glad you, I'm glad you yeah, told that story about um, flying down to Texas. Um, Cause yeah, it's great. That's impactful. That That's it's great work that, that you're doing, John, and I mean all the supporters of the thing, but you're, you're spearheading it, and uh, you and, Car and Carissa. Yeah. Um, so, but it's great work that you're doing. Uh, we'll spread the word, sir. I will. The word will be spread. <laughs> spread it wide, <laughs> far. It's, it's nice and thick, like uh, <laughs> peanut butter, like my peanut butter and jellies. Um, all right. Uh, Thank you for know. your time, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for coming on, and uh, we'll again, see you in like, a couple of weeks. Yeah, get out there, check out the you know the website again is. Uh, for if you wanted to give um for battens is what is it again, Courtney? Wheelerswarriors.org. Freaking that's a cool one. Wheelers, Wheelers, and, and Warriors. There's yeah. there's links in there. There's an entire tab for the golf tournament. Yeah, uh, it's a cool also website. Go check out his his research uh fund through BBDF, um, okay. as well as just additional information. Um, 
I'm happy to provide that as well. Love it. Love it. Um, and uh, and if you wanted to get in touch with John, I'm going to have his email in the description and all that. And send him a note if, or, if you wanted to, to, to join the, the fun bunch that is the Gain Invitational. Um, yes. All righty. That's a wrap then, fellas. Um, yeah, they- Delaware looks good on you. You, Thank and, uh, you. <laughs> you and Joe Biden are thriving over there. There's something in the water. <laughs> I stay down south. <laughs> I don't know about this Rehoboth thing. No. There's something in the water. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, it's it's been great. It's been great. I've been here pretty much since last fall. Excellent. Um, so I'm looking at the ocean right now. Uh, um, anyway, next time I see you guys, I'll give you, I'll give you a hug. See you in person. Can't wait. Um, I love a garish hug. That is it. That is it. <laughs> love you guys. <laughs> All right, guys. See you soon. Bye. All right. See you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, you got it.